Hey guys, welcome to BMW Blog and welcome to Portugal. Today is the day when I have a chance once again to drive the BMW i5 eDrive 40. By once again, I mean I had a chance to drive it actually a few months ago, but it was a prototype of pre-production series car. Now it's finally here and now I can actually enjoy this car on some of those beautiful, beautiful roads around Lisbon. But before I do that, in this video, I'm going to be talking about the design of the car, exterior and interior, about the specs, and then of course, we'll get to drive the car and show you what it can do. So let's kick it off. Exterior design. There is a lot to say because the car has been a lot more controversial than I would have expected. When the 7 Series came out, I knew that car is going to get a lot of social media hate, if you like to call it that way. But when I saw the 5 Series first time, I really, really thought that people would embrace the design because it was different, it was unique, but maybe because it's so unique and different, that's why people don't really like it. Because if you look into the history of the brand with the 5 Series, especially the E39 and all these beautiful generations, then of course, you might be disappointed seeing the new 5 Series. Personally, when I see the car in real life, I feel like it has a very, very special presence and you don't even need to warm up to the car because it does look great from all the angles. So let's take a look at some of the things that I like on the i5 eDrive 40. At the front, completely new design of the car and that starts with the headlights. Still double headlamps, but now you have this inner graphics right there, which are similar to some of the products that you've seen recently from BMW, like the X1, for example, and you will probably see it on some upcoming models. Nonetheless, it's still the iconic double headlamps. And I asked BMW, why did you move away from really the traditional double headlamps look? And they said, well, there are too many brands trying to copy us. And if you look maybe at the VW Golf and some other products, they have a similar interpretation with the Corona lights that we've seen on some BMWs. So that's one of the reasons why. Of course, they also wanted to make the car look more digital, maybe even more premium. And that's the reason why they decided to go with that design. Overall, quite slick, as you can see, quite narrow right there, even though it widens as it goes around the car but they look really, really nice, especially at nighttime. So because this is the i5 eDrive 40, not the i5 M60, the Kine grille, it's different. Instead of the horizontal bars that you see on the M60, you have the traditional Kine grille from a BMW. Of course, it's closed off. It's an electric car, so it doesn't need that additional cooling for the engine under the hood. There is no engine under the hood. It's also got the M Sport package. So because of that, of course, it's a lot more aggressive. A lot of shapes going on. As you can see right here, a couple of very angular shapes right there. And then, of course, you have this whole area with the air deflectors, as BMW calls them, which are quite aggressive in design. And they are painted in this piano black. The car does get the traditional BMW shark nose. We've always loved that on a BMW design car, and it's present on this one as well. Of course, it's not as pronounced as in the past, probably because of regulations and pedestrian safety and all of that, but nonetheless, it's still there. You can also see the hood quite aggressive in design. Instead of the typical two lines that you have running across, now you have actually four. So you have those two creases right there that end into the kidneys. And then of course you have this central crease that kind of connects all the way down there. I'm assuming it might have some aerodynamic properties as well. But overall, these are some of the major changes at the front end. And unmistakably, you will recognize this car as a BMW because once again, traditional Kine grille and the double headlamps. Now, if we go to the side, of course, we we're going to take a look at the proportions of the car because it's quite similar in size with the outgoing G30. The design is different, though, because as you can see right here, the car has a more of a coupage line in the back. If you look at the G30, you might have seen this line kind of extending a little bit more before it kind of drops. But this one starts kind of right here and it drops all the way into the half Meister King. Thankfully, luckily, this one has a Hofmeister King, and I'm happy to see that back on a BMW. You can see right there, it's even got the number 5 engraved on it. Flush door handles, not surprised. I mean, we've seen the i4, the i7, and the iX, so I expected to see that on the car as well. You also have this rocker panel, 
which I believe can be customized on certain models. I'm not sure about the i5, but I've seen it on the 530e and it's got a totally different design there. And it looks actually quite, quite interesting. It's got the M Sport package. So of course you're gonna get some M badges as you can see right there. One badge that denotes the sportiness maybe of that package, if you will. There are a couple other interesting things to point out on the side of the car. You have this crease line that runs across the entire car. And as you can see, it kind of ends right there. So it gives the car a more aggressive and dynamic look from the side. You have an additional crease on the bottom as well. And that's usually used to kind of break down the height of the car to make it look a lot shorter maybe and a lot closer to the ground. So, other than that, it is a very, very clean design from the side, but of course, BMW always likes to use these creases to create this dynamic effect of their design. It's got 21-inch wheels available, aero wheels, as you see here. I actually love this design on those wheels. They're kind of closed off, but they look quite, quite sporty. And then, of course, you have the blue calipers from the M Sport brakes. Optional wheels, those are not standard. It even says right there from BMW Individual. Now, let's go to the back and see what has changed there. Of course, you still have the panoramic roof, and we're going to talk about that once we go inside the car. But as you come around the car, you can see more of the coupe -ish line. I remember talking to Domago Duquets, the head of design. He was telling me that he wanted to infuse into this design more of an Italian flair, and I guess that's the idea of a more fast back line right there. If you come to the back, you will see also brand new taillights. So BMW calls this L-shaped, stacked up L-shaped taillights. I would say they're just two bars that wrap around the car and they connect right there. If you see them at nighttime, they actually look really, really cool. And as always, BMW tries to emphasize the width of the car by kind of sticking out the taillights a little bit more. The diffuser, very, very solid. Of course, this is not the i5 M60. You will see it on their car. That diffuser, it's a lot more aggressive, a lot sporty. This one, it's a clean design, of course, in piano black. It's pipeless, electric car, so you don't need pipes, that's for sure. E-Drive 40 badge, there is no spoiler as well. Of course, you will see that on the i5 M60. You open up the trunk, I'm pretty sure I got some things in there, but as you can see, quite, quite spacious. I have a backpack, but you can easily fit at least two, three bags in there, and you have some additional storage underneath as well. So this is the design of the BMW i5 E-Drive 40. In conclusion, it's a good design. I am not a car designer, so I'm not gonna be able to tell you if I could do it better. Of course, it's easy to criticize design. We've done it, you've done it. But honestly, once you see this car in real life, I feel like you will fall in love with this car because it does have some really nice proportions and I believe it drives really nice as well. Of course, BMW worked quite a bit on the interior design as well because it's not just about the exterior. We spend so much time inside our cars and especially when you spend so much money on an i5, you want to make sure that first of all, it's luxurious, it's got premium materials, and then of course, it's got that typical BMW driving orientation. So with that being said, how about we hop inside and I'm going to tell you more about this car and what's new. BMW 5 Series interior design, or the i5 in this case, and at the first glance, you might be thinking, this looks like a 7 Series, and you're not wrong. I would say this is a mini 7 Series or mini i7, because a lot of those components from that car are found in the new i5 as well. Naturally, large curve display, we expected this in the car, so I am not surprised, you know, to see it in the i5 and also in the 5 Series you are getting iDrive 8.5. So from the factory, when it goes into production, you will get the upgraded iDrive 8.5. And I'm gonna show you in a second why I actually like that about the car. Of course, you can see right here, a very minimalistic dashboard. You are losing the physical buttons as we expected. So essentially everything moved inside iDrive. Then you also have these vents controls right there so if you want to control the airflow you're going to be doing that basically center stack once again typical to a 7 series you have crystal controls all over the i drive knob of course this toggle shifter and of course this piano black all around it wireless charging of course you expect to see that in the car cup holders no surprise there plenty of trim options 
you can see it right there this is more of an aluminum trim but then again uh, you can customize that if that's something that you don't like there is an interaction bar it doesn't extend all the way as on the bmw i7 or 7 series you can see it starts there then there is another component on the left side similar features as on that car you can customize the light there's some flashlights that come on if you get a phone call so on and so forth biggest change in the car it is offered with a full veganza leather so essentially vegan leather and you can see it right here perforated and this is an option that's available standard in the bmw i5 and in the 5 series steering wheel once again one of my favorite things recently in bmw design it's the introduction of these flat bottom steering wheels we've seen it on the i7 m7e you've seen it on the ix a little bit even though that one looks a little bit different but i do like this design quite a bit nice and beefy and i'm gonna have a chance to see how it feels when i drive the car in a little bit there is a boost button right there and i'm gonna be talking about that when we drive the car as well so now let's dive in into the bmw iDrive 8.5 because probably that's one of the most important additions to the car in my opinion iDrive 8.5 so let me show you what's new essentially you're getting this feature called quick select and what it means really that some of the shortcuts some of the widgets can be customized and shown on the left side here the idea is that if you use a particular feature more than others then you can actually put them right there and it's easy to access startup screen it always has the map bmw feels like that's the most important thing in the car and it might be right but then of course you can actually customize this as well so i believe you can go down here and pick something else as far as the background you can see it right there and now i want to go back to navigation one of the biggest changes in iDrive 8.5 and iDrive 9 it's of course the simplification of the ac controls so let me show you a couple of ways quick shortcut to access the seat cooling seat heating and of course the steering wheel heating as well you can also go here and you will see this digital dashboard basically so everything that you had down here as far as physical buttons they're now digital right there they're easy to access a lot more intuitive a lot easier to use than in iDrive 8 for example of course I still wish we had physical buttons but I guess that boat has sailed take a look at other features if you go up trying to find the new ones yes so you have YouTube available inside the car I'm not sure if it's gonna work because the internet connection is quite spotty here we're using cars from Germany in Portugal and roaming might not be working so you can see I don't have any signal right there now if I go back I can also show you the Bundesliga app once again it might not work because of the signal but essentially brand new app and it can be used to watch live uh, football soccer uh, from Germany now let me show you the charging option settings in the car of course you can see right there you can have a bunch of different settings that you can adjust so once again you can have the charging mode then you can set up a time when you want it to start let's say you want to save on electricity or you want to charge it off peak times you can do that you also have this departure plan as they call it essentially you can precondition the car before you leave you can set up the departure time and the car will be ready for you at the right temperature that you want of course the battery will be you know heated up and ready to go so you will actually extend the electric drive range on the car you also have the charging target so let's say you want to charge the car only to 80 percent that's usually recommended on lithium-ion batteries so you can adjust that of course nothing new there essentially um, something that you've seen on the BMW i7 as well precondition the battery once again another feature right there you can activate it automatically so I'm not going to spend too much time on that and of course you go to the fan loudness once again I usually do the unrestricted because that will make sure that it charges the fastest basically so that's the charging menu let's see what else it's new of course I have to show you the air console so I had a chance to play with this a few months ago in Berlin but essentially what you can do is this launch the air console hopefully it works even though I don't think we have signal here but you can actually play games on that and after I do my driving experience with the car maybe I'll find a spot where there is a really good connection I can show you how it actually works but you get the idea there 
All right, so enough talk about the design and digital aspects of the car. I think the most exciting thing about coming to Portugal is really to drive on those, some of those curvy roads. So with that being said, we're going to go for a drive right now. I'm going to be talking about the driving dynamics of the car. I'm going to tell you how it's different from the i5 M60. And I'm also going to keep an eye on the electric range and also on the efficiency of the car. So with that being said, let's go for a ride. All right, so here I am behind the wheel of the i5 eDrive 40. Just finished the interior and exterior design review. I had to go change quickly because it's so hot in Portugal today, but now I am behind the wheel of this entry-level i5. So before we talk about the driving experience, because of course everyone cares about that, let me start with the specs because we're in stop and go traffic right now. So this might be the perfect opportunity before I hit some of these curvy roads around Sintra. So compared to the i5 M60, the E40, it's actually a single motor electric car. Of course, it's placed in the rear. It makes 335 horsepower and 295 pounds feet of torque. Of course, if you are using the boost mode, you are getting some additional power, I believe up to 317, so about 26 extra horsepower. Of course, it's not going to be as fast as the BMW i5 M60, but it will be fast enough to take you from 0 to 60 miles per hour in about 5.7 seconds. Top speed, also a little bit lower than the i5 M60, it is capped at 193 kilometers per hour. Of course, we need to talk about the battery, right? Because that's quite important in electric cars, if not one of the most important things that you can talk about when you review an electric vehicle. So 81.4 kilowatts hours, that's the usable capacity of the car. That's going to give you 295 miles of range, which is significantly better than the projected 256, 258 that you will find in a BMW i5 M60. Of course, charging is equally important and the BMW i5 eDrive 40, just like the i5 M60, comes with a capacity of charging of 205 kilowatts. That's a little bit better than you will find in the BMW i7 M70. So what does it mean in real life? Well, essentially, you could fill up the battery from 10 to 80% in about 34 minutes. BMW also told me that if you wanna get just a quick charge in, if you plug it in for 10 minutes, it should give you about 156 kilometers. Of course, that's on the WLTP cycle. If you have a home charger and you like to install one, or if you can find an AC charging station, then the BMW i5 eDrive 40 actually comes standard with a 11 kilowatts charging capability. Of course, you can pay extra and that's going to give you 22 kilowatts capability. So again, what does it mean in real life scenarios? Essentially, you can charge the battery with a 22 kilowatts in about 4.25 hours, but it will take a little bit more than double, so about 8.5 hours if you're using the 11 kilowatts capacity. Another important fact, because we're all about facts right now, and I'm going to geek out a little bit today, it's the weight. So the eDrive 40 comes with a DIN weight, which means empty and no driver, of 2130 kilograms. So this is not a very light car, but it should be lighter than the i5 M60. So when I drive that car, I'm going to share the stats on that one as well. Wheels, of course, they are equally important when it comes to efficiency and especially to the driving experience. Both the i5 E40 and the M60 can go up to 21 inches in size, and that's exactly the spec that I have today. Now, let's talk more about some technical aspects in the i5 E40. So let's start with the suspension. In the rear, standard, you are getting a steel suspension, so coiled spring suspension in the rear. If you pay extra for the eDrive 40, you can actually get a rear axle air suspension, which comes from the BMW i7. It is standard actually in the BMW i5 M60, and we're gonna talk about that as well. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to really test the cold spring suspension because none of these test cars here actually have it. So the only one that's available, it's the air suspension, and I'm gonna tell you how it feels when I drive. So at the first glance, even going through some of these little cities here and even on straight roads, I can tell you that you are getting a lot of comfort from that air suspension. And that's expected because essentially it's a feature that you use in luxury cars, in cars that you don't want to take very sporty rides with. 
Of course, you can still do that. And once I hit some of these curvy roads, I'm going to talk about that and what it means to transfer the character of the BMW i5 from a comfort mode to a sporty mode. If the eDrive 40 comes with the air suspension, then you will be able to adjust the stiffness of that suspension. So if you go from a comfort to a sport mode, you will be able to tell the difference. It will also be quite relevant if you drive on uneven surfaces because you will feel that suspension actually managing to even out the impurities in the road. Additionally, because we're all about details today, there is a compression strut which connects the rear section and the rear axle to increase the stiffness of the chassis. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about steering. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that once I'm still going to start doing some really spirity driving here. So, at the first glance, going in comfort mode, I can tell you that the steering still lacks a bit of the engagement of previous BMWs. And just like I've said it before with some of the new BMWs, so it's a little bit dead off center. And what do I mean by that? If you're driving on a straight road, the steering is quite, quite soft. And of course, that's also a limitation of the EPS system. Back in the day when we had the hydraulic steerings, it was completely different. You could feel the front wheels at all time and the connection to the road. But as car companies and BMW switch to the EPS system, then things have changed quite a bit. Of course, with every generation, they try to improve that and they manage to make small increments with every model that I test. But once again, if you're in comfort mode in this car, you will feel that that steering doesn't bring a lot of feedback from the road. I do expect that to change when I hit some of those curvy roads because I'm gonna flick the car into the sport mode and that's going to actually make the car stiffer. It's gonna make the steering a lot more responsive and probably it will make me feel a lot more connected to the road and to the front axle. So with the BMW i5, it's not always about tight bends and curvy roads, but also about driving assistant features. I'm on a highway stretch on my way to Lisbon, and I'm gonna be able to show you how it works and what it does. BMW calls this package the highway assistant, and essentially it's a level two plus functionality that's available in the BMW i5. It's also available with a new feature, which is called automatic lane change. And we're gonna show you that in a quick demo in a few seconds. But before that, let me tell you more about the ADAS systems in the BMW i5. You have up to 40 driving assistance features, and that's possible because the car comes with about 20 sensors, an eight megapixel camera, and also a full range radar, which can see objects up to 300 meters ahead. But of course, to learn more about that, I would love to talk to a BMW engineer who can explain a lot better what they do and what they are. So let's go pick him up and let's go for a drive and we'll learn more about this. Okay, so now it's time to test the highway assistant with the automatic lane change. Unfortunately, I can't do it in the i5 E40 or the i5 M60 because we're in Portugal and the system is not yet approved for the market here. So, in order to test this, I had to go to the hotel. I picked up Martin right here. Uh, he's gonna explain what he does at BMW and we're gonna go with a special prototype to test the functions in Lisbon on the highway. So, first of all, Martin, thanks for joining me. Good to have you. All right, Martin, so tell me, what are we testing today? So what we are testing today in Portugal is uh, the highway assistant, BMW highway assistant, um, which offers you a level two hands-free function where we can, we can actually remove your hands off the steering wheel. And it comes in combination with the automatic lane change, which allows you to accept suggestions from the vehicle to change the lane by looking into the mirror and by uh, watching the traffic from behind. So in yeah. other words, you will be able to change lanes by simply just moving your head to the left or right? Yeah, that is, the, that is right. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so how do we test that? What do I need to do? So we, we tested that we activate the lateral control. Okay, So the I.O. Press the I.O. button. Okay, right there. So Perfect, yeah, activate it. You, you gain lateral control and then okay. you can simply remove your hands okay, so whenever it hands offers free. Assist Plus ready. Sure. And Assist Plus turns green okay. and it rolls out the green carpet, which okay. means you're in Assist Plus now. Perfect. Yeah, this is the level two hands-free. Okay. And what we do is we watch your eyes and, okay. and, and where your head is pointing at in order to ensure that you're actually watching the traffic. So now I turn to the left and it's going to change lanes. That's it. Okay. And it looks like it's working with glasses as well. 
yeah. which is great because mine, they're not really see-through, so that's quite impressive. It's actually able to track that. All right, so right now, essentially, if there is another car in front of me, if there is slow traffic, or if there is a fast car coming behind me and I'm going too fast, I might get the offer one more time to go to the right. That is, that is true. And okay. you will get the offer two times? Two times, two and then times. it goes away? Two times, and when it goes away... Um, okay. So if you don't accept it, yeah, if, you know, within a certain yeah, time true, limit, yeah. is there a time limit on it? Yeah, there is a very small time limit. Small like time, between okay. The, between the offer and that, and, and that you or actually have to accept it. Gotcha. Because we have to make sure that you're actually actually accepting mm -hmm. this one and not just looking around. Okay. Yeah. So that's the thing. A lot of people are wondering, what if I move my head to the left and right? But I guess what initially was not understood is the fact that you're not actually able to initiate the lane change with your this head. Mm -hmm. You have to wait for the car to tell you it's okay to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do this? Press okay, basically, yeah. right? So, I mean, and I just got it right now. Okay, so let's do this. And how long do I have to look into the right mirror? Or left for mirror? a very short period of time. It just, like just have to be second, two seconds? Uh, less. less. Less than that? Less, yeah. So you can actually just do yeah. this and yeah. then I mean, bring the, just, gotcha. just enough what, what you typically do, just okay. to watch the traffic it is, if, if it is free. I mean, the car gotcha. itself also detects if there is free space on, on, on the lane you want to change to. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's, it's, a, it's a double check using you as the driver, still being responsible in this level 2 function um, to, to accept that. Yeah. But, but okay. as you say, the car gives you the suggestion whenever it thinks it, it, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you say, approaching a slower car, mm -hmm. or you're, you're remaining on the left-hand lane because you forget to, to, to go to the other lane back, mm -hmm. uh, to the right-hand side, and then it will give you that offer. Gotcha. And it will give you the offer twice. If you don't accept, it will stop giving you that offer because it doesn't want to know you. If, oh, okay, so if you don't accept it twice, then yeah. it will stop. Is, for how long does it stop? What if I want to use it? Like, for, how do I trigger it then? For that situation. For, for the situation. For that situation. That car. Gotcha. For okay, so for yep. that instance, that particular instance, Correct. you'll get it twice. If you don't accept it, uh -huh. it's gone. Then if the next one occurs, essentially you will get another offer. Yeah, so now I just got yeah. one on the left. So let me do that. Let me trust it. Oh, actually, it, it just went away, so it probably wasn't fast enough. All right, let's see now. One second. There it is. Now I'm looking for it. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit more used to this. I don't have to like really stare that mirror. But what if there is a situation, there is a crazy car on the Autobahn coming from behind, let's say like super, super fast, and the car assumes that you have space, but then you might be, you know, you might be cutting too close. Is there is there a way for the car to go back to its lane or essentially once that offer is done, it's done? Definitely depends on the speed. It is okay. Typically, we, we would abort the offer. So you right? abort the offer, okay. If it, if, it, if it detects another car from in, coming from the back, um, it detects it with the short-range sensors behind the bumper. So there's a short-range sensor in uh, radar in the back uh, as well? Short-range radar in the bumper, yeah. Got it. That's correct. Okay, now let's focus a little bit on the highway assistant, the actual function, the hands-free function. So mm -hmm. what's the maximum top speed that you can achieve hands-free? It goes by design up to 130 kilometers per hour. Okay, so yeah. about 85 miles per hour in the U.S. will be. Uh, All right, and it was just approved in Germany, from what I recall. Yeah, it was uh, with a special permit in Germany. Okay. Yeah, since following the UNEC regulation, we would not be allowed to take our hands to offer a function where you can actually take your hands off the steering wheel. Um, what we can do in the U.S. as of today, right? We introduced okay. it in, in the S7. Mm -hmm. In the U.S. market, also in Canada. Okay. In Germany, we needed a special permit because we are deviating a bit from the UNEC, and thus we need special measures. Okay. The, the fundamental measure, basically, is that we are, I mean, the, the same technology that we're using uh, for you to accept the lane change, uh, we, we watch where you watch, right? Okay. Uh, and if you're watching the road, if, if, if you're checking the surroundings, um, then we still let you go hands-free. If, if you don't do that, we remind you to do that again. If okay. you refuse, we then would have to take away the functionality and then you go back into hands-on. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Very interesting. All right. So you mentioned the i7, so I, had to, I have to go there a little bit. Is this the, the automatic lane change, is that coming to the i7 or 7 series as well? Yeah. It will come to the i7 and 7 series as well. Okay. Yeah. Is there a time frame for that or approximately? Is it this year, next year? Yeah. I, th I think next next year you can expect to have that. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And in the future, is it fair to say that any car equipped with the proper hardware for level two plus or level two hands free will also get the automatic lane change? Yeah, it, it will become a part over time of the of the highway assistant. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and that's something you can upgrade over over the air basically. 
since since it needs different hardware, it's not upgradable. Um, but as long as he has the hardware, and he, let's say if he doesn't have the feature like the i7 7 series, you will get it as an OTA, or will it come from the factory with that already? It, it will come ex factory. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Let me see what else. Can we test this automatic lane change if I cover my one eye? So I mean, granted, I do have you know little eyes. Um, can always see inside them, which is which is a good thing. But um, let's see if I uh, if if I get the offer and I cover one eye, if that's gonna work. I know it's an extreme use case, but I guess it's fun to see if that works. Mm -hmm. And if not, I might have to let you do it. You know, it seems like you have bigger eyes than me. So let's see if we get the offer. All right. So right now I got the offer. All right. So that didn't work. Well, let's try the other eye. Okay, so that worked, but I can I tell you what I did? So I actually opened up my eye a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, if I'm squinting clearly because there is sun and all of that, clearly it couldn't it couldn't really see my pupils. I mean, it's yeah. it's kind of normal, I, I guess. But I try to keep my eye as wide as possible, and I guess that works. So that's yeah. so that's quite cool. So it's interesting that you're actually covering that use case too, because right, I mean, it's maybe not a very popular use case, but there are. No people with disabilities that would probably need of that. Course. It would be cool of to course. think about that. So that's very interesting. All right, guys. So that was a quick overview of the highway assistant in a BMW i5. I'm going to hop outside of this car, the test car, and I'm going to go back into my BMW i5 E40. Let me tell you about the braking capabilities and the brake regeneration feature in the BMW i5 because that's quite important, especially in an electric car that needs that immediate stopping power, especially as you take off with that instant torque. So the BMW i5 cars come with a brake by wire system, which essentially is set up with a high pressure ramp. So what does it mean in real life scenarios? Where under dynamic movements, the braking system gives more braking feedback to match the steering's feedback. Now, of course, let's talk about the brake regeneration. In the BMW i5 eDrive 40, because it comes with just a single motor in the rear, the brake regen is kept to 120 kilowatts. Of course, in the i5 M60, you will get a lot more brake regen power, and we're gonna talk about that when I swap the cars and drive that one. There is a new mode in the BMW i5, it's also on the i7 M70, and it's called Max Range. Doesn't get more obvious than that. So. While the term might be self-explanatory, let me tell you a little bit about the secret sauce behind the scenes. So essentially, you will be able to extend the range by about 25%. And how does BMW achieve that? Well, they reduce the power on the motor in the rear. Of course, they will do the same on the i5 M60 and the dual motors. And it will also reduce certain comfort features inside the car, like the ventilated seats, for example it will also cap your top speed. So with that max range mode activated, you will be able to achieve a top speed of only 90 kilometers per hour. Of course, that's ideal, especially when you're going through some of these curvy roads where you don't need that top speed at all time, but you still want to increase that efficiency. So the combination of the brake regen and the max range mode should do the job. Of course, it's not all about highway driving and about dynamic driving. It's also about commuting maybe within a city center. Even though I'm not in a major city right now, I am in stop and go traffic in a small town around Lisbon. And I can at least experience what it feels like to live with a car on a daily basis. So let me talk about that a little bit. Despite being quite big in size compared to the i4, even though we see it somewhere between an i4 and i7 clear as far as size, it is still considerably big and of course it is a little bit heavy compared to the outgoing models because of the electrification and the batteries and all of that. But it's that going to impact or affect the normal daily driving. And I would say no, actually driving through these little roads and this stop and go traffic, the car feels a lot lighter, a lot more agile than I would have thought. I absolutely enjoy driving the i4, especially the M50, but also the eDrive 40. And in many ways, in stop and go traffic or in slow traffic, it actually feels kind of the same way. So I can't really tell if there is a huge difference in the maneuverability maybe of the car, especially in this type of situations. I also like the power delivery in this car because it is 
progressive, it is quite smooth. Of course, it's not meant to be as aggressive as on the i5 M60 or the i7 M70. And maybe this is why I truly enjoy the eDrive 40 in this type of you know, daily driving situations, especially in slower traffic. Because if you constantly have to take off from the stoplight or from a stop sign, then you don't always want that neck snapping power that you might get from other cars. We'll see if my impression changes as soon as I go for some dynamic driving because of course sometimes it's all about that and I don't mind pushing the cars close to their limit. All right so here is the fun part. Here we go. Drag race with the BMW i5 E40. Let's position the car. All right sport mode on, boost mode on. Let's see. All right, so 5.62, I believe 5.7, it's the advertised one. So pretty spot on. Let's do one more run. Good to go. All right, 5.66. The only difference here is that I only got the boost mode for eight seconds because I waited a couple of seconds before I have launched. So I'm assuming that was the difference. But nonetheless, you can see immediately that the advertised speed, it's quite relevant. I'm assuming that compared to the i7 M7 that I did yesterday, where there was a little bit of a delta there, was probably because that car did not have the high performance tires. So this is the drag race with the i5 E40. Now we're going to continue driving and tell you more about the car and then later today we're going to do the same thing with the i5 M60. Finally some really nice curvy roads, not a lot of traffic. First things first, make sure we're in sport mode. Sport, 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 everything it's in sport, perfect. Drivetrain, steering, damping, everything it's dialed all the way up. So let's see how it feels. So as I said earlier, if you want to have a comfortable ride, of course, you will always pick the comfort mode. But if you want to go on spirit drives, you should always pick the sport mode. What I like a lot about recent BMWs is the fact that you have this dual character car. If you've been watching my videos in the last few years, I've been talking about this quite a bit. Essentially, BMW decided to have this wider gap in between driving modes. So if you want to have a very comfortable, very plush, very relaxed car then you can always use that comfort mode now if you want to transform the character of the car you will always go into the sport mode and the gap in between the two it's quite significant because even from a suspension point of view from a steering you can tell that there are actually two very different settings in the past that was not the case it was always a little bit annoying because you could never tell if you're in comfort, am I in sport? You always had to kind of look at the screen and figure it out, but now you will feel it immediately. And that starts with the steering. I've talked about the steering being quite numb in comfort. Well, that changes a little bit when you go into sport. I can feel already a lot more connection to the front wheels. I mean, there is a lot more heft in the steering. It's not as numb as before. The inputs are fairly sharp. I mean, they're still not as sharp as, let's say, in an M car. And I'm assuming I'm going to be experiencing this a lot better in the i5 M60. So, cornering, what does it feel like? On the first glance, I can tell you that this one feels a lot closer to an i4 than to an i7. And that's a good thing, because I do want the 5 Series to be closer to a 3 and to a 4 than to a 7 Series. In the end, this is still a car that likes to be driven dynamically. And that's exactly what I'm doing right here, because it's not always about that comfortable and plush ride, but it's also about that weekend fun. And you're definitely getting this in the i5 e-tri 40, because you have a rear motor, so all that power is going to the rear axle, and that's awesome. As much as I love the all-wheel drive and the extra power of all these M60 and M70s, I feel like this is still the closest to a BMW car than a let's say a dual motor car that gives you a lot of power of course that's neck snapping power and I'm sure I'll have a lot of fun with the i5 M60 later today but honestly for now 
I have to say, I really, really enjoy this E40 because if you want to have fun with this one, all you got to do is just push hard, use those brakes to your advantage to brake late. You can see right here, really great brakes. You turn in, so good. I mean, you can tell I'm in the sport mode, a lot more responsive, a lot more feedback from the road. So you can also go into the DSC off, which I never recommend, especially with cars like this, because they have so much instant torque. And if you're not careful, I promise you that rear end will step out and you will do something really, really stupid. There is a safety lock apparently in place. BMW told me that even if you disable the DSC completely off, the limited slip is still somewhat active. So even if you're trying to do some shenanigans, maybe you're not gonna be able to achieve that. But I'm sure if right conditions met, you will be able to get in trouble with this one quite, quite easily. Now we, or I left that section of twisty roads and I'm back into one of these little villages. And once again, I can test the suspension right now because I'm on this really bouncy road. I mean, it's, it's, it's not ideal to drive on a daily commute, but I felt immediately the suspension doing the work. So that rear axle air suspension, it's great. I don't see myself really getting the coil spring suspension in a five series. I mean, this car is also meant to be luxurious and comfortable. So I absolutely recommend getting that air suspension. I mean, right here, I can feel just the wheels working individually, how they rebound from the suspension, like right there, the left one. So instead of the car moving sideways, the car actually moves mostly vertically and that's quite nice because you're not getting those lateral forces. All right, so as you can see right here, I'm maneuvering through city center once again. Extremely, extremely easy to maneuver the car. I mean, it's almost effortless, honestly. You don't even have to think about it. I mean, still in Sport Plus and even now, you know, the car, it's really not uncomfortable at all as a daily driver. And turning in, I mean, remember, we're in Europe, so we have these really tight roads compared to the American roads. And it's always nice to have a car that, despite its size, you can easily maneuver it inside city centers or tight parking spaces, for example. So let's go back on to some uh, fun driving roads. So once again, unpaved road, suspension. And it's really hard to explain through video, so you will essentially have to drive the car, but this is the perfect example where you can test the suspension of a car. It doesn't get better than this. If I were to look for a road like this, I wouldn't be able to actually find it. So even here turning in, as you can see, the car rotates nicely. A little bit of understeering in the back. I could feel that rear end just stepping out slightly before the nanny controls kicked in. But here we go. I like the power delivery too. I have to mention that it is absolutely not neck snapping and that's a good thing because as much as I love, you know, the zero to 60 times and it's always great to brag about that. It's really not about that. It's really about lateral driving dynamics and how the car feels when you push it quite hard, not only in straight line. So once again, very progressive, very smooth power delivery. Yet, once it kicks in, I mean, it just keeps on going. I mean, you really need to be careful because it will go over legal speed limits in no time. You constantly got to pay attention to the speedometer. So here we go. I'm actually in the B mode right now. And what's nice about this, it's the fact that I can use the brake regen to my advantage to actually brake. But let's see if I can make it a little bit more aggressive. So let's try that. So let's see if the, that's going to get me sick or not. All right, so here we go. Braking hard. The rear end, you might have heard it. I mean, again, look at this. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful roads. You heard the wheel. Oh yes, this is a lot of fun. I mean, this is, this is really, really fun to drive. I'm assuming I can't do this for too long because I'm kind of get probably car sick especially oh here we go so i just went over a speed bump right and that was the perfect example once again of how good their air suspension is i mean look right there very very smooth goes up in the air lands nicely rebounds 
I'm gonna say this is my favorite road right now because I was able to test the suspension in quite a few different scenarios without having to drive too far out. Here we go, another nice bend here. Gotta watch the bicycles all the time, of course. Pushing hard. I mean, just fantastic. You heard that, right? So I'm, not even, I'm actually with DSC on, so I'm not even DSC off. But that proves my point that if you want to have some fun with this car, you don't need to go all out. You can still have fun. Of course, the sticky tires help quite a bit on this one. 21 inch, they're actually quite silent for 21 inch wheels, so not too bad. Here we go, another speed bump, so let's see. Nicely done, nicely done BMW, nicely done. A lot of speed bumps, here we go. All right, let's do one more loop. So keep in mind, here we go, another nice elevation there. B mode, quite aggressive, so I just literally just lift up the brake pedal and the accelerator and it did the job for me. I think I'm gonna have to put a camera on my head and do one more loop to show you what it looks like because this is just a lot of fun to do this all day long. It might be boring to watch this, I don't blame you if you're bored by now, but if you were in the car right now, I promise you, you'll be having a lot of fun. I might not be looking like I'm having fun because I'm trying to stay focused and not do something stupid, but I promise you, I am laughing inside right now. Here we go, another nice turn here, turning in like I like that one very smooth very smooth turning in can also brake quite late with a brake region on as well with the B pedal so let's say if I lift up the power pedal do we call it the power pedal the accelerator I'm not sure I always want to say the gas pedal but if I do that then I'm probably gonna get yelled at by you guys all right, so let's do one more loop with a GoPro camera on my head, a POV look. So give me one second to set up and we'll go for another drive. All right, so got my camera on, POV view. I guess POV means view, so never mind. And let's go for a ride and see what we can do with the car. Still in the sport mode, but let me show you the boost mode for here. So boost pedal right there. Pull on this, 10 seconds of additional power. So, yeah, I mean, you can feel it immediately. I mean, honestly, it's only about 26 HP and maybe about 50, I don't know, 60 pounds feet of torque, but you can absolutely feel it for those few seconds that you get it activated. And I think you can do it again, right? So, yeah, here we go. I mean, it's absolutely amazing, amazing. All right, so let's do a little bit of driving here, it's trying to stay safe. Once again, here is how effortless it is to corner. Brake a little bit here, turn the car, and now push hard again. There's a little bit of traffic ahead, but you get the idea. And I mean, the brakes are really good. Honestly, these are some of the best brakes that BMW has ever done. I've said it on the i7 M70, especially on that car. It's such a heavy car, and the brakes are perfect. I'm assuming the upgraded brakes on the i5 M60, they're even better because I believe you can upgrade that even more with the M Sport Pro package. I'm not entirely sure, but we will check on that when we drive the car. All right, so let's see. These are some really nice roads, honestly. Curvy, bouncy, you move around quite a bit. Of course, there is a little bit of body roll, right? I mean, you can't really hide that. I've said it before. No matter what you try, you're always gonna have that, but it's just not too bad. And here we go. It's so much power, unbelievable. Just unbelievable power. Here we go. That suspension works really, really nice. Really tight roads for sure, so you better be careful here. It's like a more of a one-way, two-way type of road. 
here we go here another nice bounce you saw the car moving a little bit to the side but it quickly rebounded as soon as the wheels met the asphalt that air suspension kicked in and whatever magic they've done on the car it really really works and honestly this road it's perfect and the other one as well to really test the suspension i know i might be repeating myself by now but just wanted to make sure that i get my point across I mean, even overtaking i mean look at this i mean even overtaking it is spectacular just so quick heard that wind spill again <laughs> it's so so much fun i mean unbelievable fun okay i get it it might not have the engine sound that we love and i love the engine sounds as well and i'm not gonna say that i'll always have just an electric car i'll probably always have a gasoline car as well but as a daily driver i already have an i3 i'm getting an i4 as well so i'm already sold on this technology for different reasons not necessarily for you know, sound and all of that. Some bus, so you always gotta watch for that. All right, so I think that's enough playing around with this one. Let me take off the POV camera and maybe talk about the conclusion of this video really and tell you a little bit about my thoughts on the car and how it compares maybe to other products I've been driven recently. We're gonna go and swap the cars in a second but before I do that let me tell you my impressions of the BMW i5 eDrive 40 especially in the context of maybe the i4 and the i7 because I've driven these cars recently quite a bit. So apples to apples comparison in many ways will be the i440 versus the i540 naturally different cars right same car architecture same gen 5 technology same battery packs same models so no difference there of course the major difference comes from the heaviness of the car and also from the size of the car the i4 it's clearly a little bit smaller it's also a little bit narrower from what i remember so it's going to give you a different driving experience the i4 really drives as a compact electric car and what do i mean by that it is quite dynamic quite sporty it has a lot less room inside but at the same time it does feel a little bit more sporty more dynamic and more fun maybe on the road at the same time the i5 i would say it drives better than the i7 and in my case that little bit better means actually that it's a lot more fun to drive the i7 might be the luxurious car that you want to go for a very long road trip but the i5 it's the weekend car that you want to push it a little bit and have some fun especially if you can find some roads like this so to me if i were to pick between the i5 and the i4 today it'll be quite a tough choice i just ordered an i4 because i didn't want to wait for the i5 it would be a lot longer to get one so for the next maybe couple of years maybe last i would be stuck with an i4 but if i had the option today maybe i would have gone for the i5 because i feel like you're not compromising too much yes might be a little bit slower yes it might not be as fun as the i4 yes it might have a little bit more body roll but other than that this is a more premium car it's more luxurious and you definitely have a lot more room inside and let me show you what i mean by that so as promised we're gonna test the interior space in the bmw i5 but i just wanted to show you that this is my normal driving position i adjusted the chair so there are no tricks involved the next bit will be i will have three guys in the back seat including myself I'm 189 the other guy is 189 as well and there is somebody else that's 179 so pretty tall guys maybe a little bit above average but we'll show you the knee room the leg room of course and also the headroom so let's go take a look all right so this is the rear seating test so let me tell you a bit about this the car it's about half a centimeter with more leg room than the g30 in the outgoing model and there is about 1.5 centimeters in height as well so more headroom so let's see how we fit in here so I'm um, 189 
Johannes is about 179, I have to mention that. Then we have Oliver around the same height as myself. So you can see we have decent knee room right here. Of course, there's some scoops in the back seat, which allows you to really stretch your knees in there if you want to. Not bad. And of course, we have plenty of headroom here. I mean, I have at least, I would say about five, six centimeters, uh, which is, you know, two, three inches, which is not bad at all. So as you can see, you can absolutely use this car as a family road trip car. Uh, and it does have more space than the i4. I tested that in the past and um, yeah, you will get more room in the i5. So if that's your concern, hopefully this video answers your question. Okay, so you saw the room in the rear bench. So clearly now you know why I wanted to pick this one over the i4, because if you travel with people, you will absolutely have a lot more room in the back and a lot more room also in the trunk. So now the only thing that remains to be done today is really to drive the i5 M60 and see how it compares to the e-drive 40. It doesn't get better than this because I will be able to drive the car on the same roads basically and I will be able to experience it in a similar way so that way I can have a more educated conclusion on should you pick the e40 or the m60 because clearly that's a question that will come up. One of my friends reached out to me yesterday, shout out to Amit, and he even asked me that question, should I go for the M60, should I go for the E40? And then I said, okay, let me drive the cars first and then I will let you know. So that's gonna be my answer to him as well. And it doesn't get more personal than that because there's someone close to me that it's interesting in buying one of these two. So I'm a lot more invested right now to make sure that I give a very educated conclusion not that i don't do that usually so with that being said thanks for watching guys i appreciate the support i hope this was not a very long and boring video i tried to touch on some of the technical details and maybe not everyone does and hopefully that was useful to you especially if you're in the market of buying the bmw i5 as always i'll see you in the next one and don't go anywhere because right now we're gonna swap the cars and we're gonna go for that crazy i5 m60 with 590 horsepower See you in the next one.